Amory, Emmett, welcome to another episode of Stock Club. This is a very special episode, very original. I think we might be the first podcast in history to talk about this topic, and that is AI. Ever heard of it? <laughs> um, we've, I think we've spent a lot of this year so far talking about, say, the business cases of AI and its implications, ChatGPT, obviously, OpenAI, then this kind of arms race between Microsoft going after Google Search, but Today, we're getting a bit more philosophical, we'll say, and we're going to talk about the dangers of this technology and, in fairness, what it could mean for humanity as a whole. I don't think we might be that qualified to talk in those scale of terms, but we're going to give it a go anyways. Um, so to kick off, Emmett, you're going to give us a bit of a history lesson on AI and the technology and all the rest, yeah? I am, Michael, indeed. Um, well, the history of AI dates back to the mid 20th century and, and the idea of creating machines that could think and learn, you know, just like humans has utterly fascinated scientists and inventors um, and programmers for centuries and more recently movie makers. But it wasn't until the 1940s that the first steps towards making AI a reality was taken. And one of the earliest pioneers in the field of AI was Alan Turing, who was a British mathematician and computer scientist, and frankly, one of the most brilliant and important people of all time. And I'd advise our listeners to just watch the movie, The Imitation Game. Have either of you guys seen it? Yep. Um, no. Probably out of 10, Anne-Marie. It's very good. It's, it's, an, it's an eight or a nine out of 10. It's very interesting. It's very well delivered. Yeah. Mike, you haven't seen it yet? No. no your man, Ben, well, come, that kind of gives me the creeps of it. <laughs> yeah well he plays alan turing who in his own right was a little bit you know odd so um anyway look great movie 10 out of 10 for me anyway in 1950 turing published a paper uh, titled computing machinery and intelligence in which he proposed a test to determine whether a machine was capable of thinking like a human and the test obviously enough became known as the turing test and it's still used today as a benchmark for AI research. Specifically, the Turing test is a measure of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human. And interestingly, it involves a human evaluator who judges the responses of a machine and a human to a series of questions in a natural language conversation. And if the evaluator can't reliably tell which response came from the machine and which came from the human, uh, the machine is said to have passed a Turing test. Well, the, the bottom line is that uh, this Turing test is still widely considered to be a benchmark for AI research, although recently it has been criticized for being a little bit too narrow and not taking into account other aspects of intelligence that go far beyond conversation. So uh, small talk machines don't make the cut anymore. Right, so during 1950s and the 1960s, researchers made really big progress in developing AI systems that could perform tasks such as playing chess and solving complex math problems, mathematical problems. Then in 1956, a group of research, researchers organized uh, the Dartmouth Conference, which is considered the birthplace of AI as a field of study. So 1956 was the formalization of this thing that is now all around us. And in the following decades, researchers and academics continued to make progress in developing AI algorithms and systems. Now, a major breakthrough came in the 1980s with the development of neural networks, which allowed machines to learn from data and improve their performance over time. In fact, when I was studying physics in Dublin City University 30 years ago, we had loads of lectures on fuzzy logic and neural networks. And even though it was cutting edge at that time, I couldn't, or at least I didn't imagine where it would be today. That said, now today I do have a stronger belief or maybe even a vision of where AI will be in 30 years from now. Uh, but anyway, that decade, 1990, saw the rise of machine learning, uh, which is a subset of AI 
that's focused on algorithms and could automatically learn patterns and make predictions based on data. And this led to the development of practical applications such as spam filters and speech recognition, uh, recognition systems, the likes of which we use all the time, which brings us right through to today, the year 2023. In recent years, AI has seen a surge of interest, as, as you said in the opening, uh, in the opener, uh, Mike, and it's seen a surge in investment and there's been a lot of breakthroughs in deep learning and natural language processing, which has paved the way for applications in areas such as autonomous vehicles and medical diagnosis. And the future of AI certainly looks very promising, um, very exciting, but in some, you know, in a lot of cases, some very worrying developments. And there's a must watch uh, lecture on YouTube uh, introduced by Steve Wozniak of Apple, and it's published uh, by the Center for Humane Technology, and it went live on YouTube on March 9th, 2023. And in the opener of this lecture, which is about an hour long, there's a, a startling and frankly chilling statistic, which says 50% of AI researchers believe there's a 10% or greater chance that humans will go extinct from our inability to control AI. And then they go on to kind of bring that into real terms and say, imagine if 50% of airplane engineers thought there was a 10% chance that everybody was going to die. Nobody would get on a plane again. And they start to build on this um, very chilling opener. And they say, they kind of put down three uh, postulates, I suppose you'd call them. The first is that they say, when you invent a new technology, you uncover a new class of responsibilities. And they illustrate that example by uh, drawing attention to the fact that maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, I can't remember, there was nothing written into law about privacy and the, uh, the things that social media has brought to the fore as a problem. So the sending of inappropriate photographs and distribution, there was no law against that 10 years ago, because frankly, the problem hadn't presented itself in such a volume that a law needed to be written. But now we have this thing called AI. So the first thing they put forward is that when you invent a new technology, you uncover a new class of responsibilities. The second thing they say is that if the tech confers power, it starts a race. So this AI has started a race. There's a race between the giants to have the better the more dominant AI systems. And this kind of race for dominance in its own right, in an unregulated space means anything can be done to grab market share. And on that point, the third thing they say, or the third postulate or whatever they say, is that if you do not coordinate it, the race will end in tragedy. So it's quite a dark lecture, but it's very, very enlightening because this tech now is upon us. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. It's out there in so many things that we see, have noticed, and indeed have not yet noticed, but will start to notice in a very, very short time. And that's why I think when the three of us were chatting yesterday in the office, we were saying it's probably a great topic for us to uh, circle back on and talk about a little more, albeit very unoriginally. Yeah, well, I think what motivated this chat was an interview from a guy called Jeffrey Hinton, who you mentioned neural networks there. I think he was one of the pioneers of that. And he's kind of seen as the godfather of AI. Um, and he recently left Google citing concerns over the flood of misinformation and the possibility for AI to upend the job market and the existential risk posed by the creation of a true digital intelligence. And if anyone kind of knows what they're talking about, it's this guy. So yeah. Anne-Marie, you took a look at this for us. How worried should we be? And don't let Emmett's kind of fear-mongering two minutes ago <laughs> affect this either. Yeah, interestingly, like the exact same lecture that um, Emmett watched, I also watched and we did not coordinate. Um, someone sent that to me a couple of days ago and I had seen it. And the a lot of the comments that Hinton made upon his exit really reflect what had come up in this lecture. Um, he basically said that he quit in order to be able to speak freely about AI and not kind of interfere with Google, which is such a big proprietor of AI. Um, and he in part regrets his contributions to the field, which is highly reminiscent of you know, people who worked on the atomic bomb in the United States, the Manhattan Project after the fact they were going, I don't really know what we were doing there. I don't know. I regret doing that. Um, 
And he was really crucial to Google's AI push up until this point. You know, he even helped develop some of the systems that underlie and chat GPT today. So like he he definitely is a, a pioneer in the field. Um, but he said that's that some of the dangers that AI chatbots pose are quite scary. Um, he said that he warned basically that they're could create an intelligence that would be more agile and impressive than human intelligence. And we don't really know what the implications of that could be. It could be um, incredibly scary. And, and the main concern that he flagged for us, which I think is probably the most realistic thing that we will encounter within maybe even the next year, if we're not already encountering it right now, is the idea of misinformation. He said, quote, it's able to produce lots of text automatically so you can get lots of very effective spam bots. It will allow authoritarian leaders to manipulate their electorates, things like that. But he added he was also concerned about the existential risk of what happens when these things get more intelligent than us. Um, so it is that idea of really this technology could run amok. It could run away from us in, in a way that we really cannot even conceive of. And probably by the time it's happening, it's, it's too late. We don't really know um, what to do with it. And again, similar to what Emmett mentioned with a lack of regulation, you know, sometimes particularly within the digital age, within the internet age, we sometimes fail to consider regulation until the problem has already occurred. Um, and that was also something that he proposed. He basically said that we have a lack of safety nets at the minute when it comes to AI development. And it was interesting to compare his comments to those of Valerie Pisano, who's the chief executive of NILA, which is the Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute. Um, and they said something similar, which is the technology is put out there and as the system interacts with humankind, its developers wait to see what happens and make adjustments based on that. We would never, as a collective, accept that kind of mindset in any other industrial field. And that is true if we think about, you know, any kind of machinery that we would get into. Think about your cars. Think about the amount of testing it has to go through. Think about the amount of testing drugs have to go through or medical devices. It's very interesting to conceive of AI as this thing that we will interact with in a way that can alter us. So why would we not be doing comprehensive testing before it's allowed to be fully released to the public? I thought that was a very interesting point. Um, Hinton also told the New York Times that until last year, he believed that Google had been a proper steward of the technology. But that changed once Microsoft started incorporating a chatbot into its Bing search. Um, and the company began becoming concerned about the risk to its search business. So it was this competitive thing. It was an arms race, exactly what Emmett mentioned. It's this panic over who's going to have control of the market share. And that is actually an interesting perspective to have. Because I remember a couple weeks ago, we were talking about AI. And I had broached the point that I had seen in a number of sources, it had been repeated that Google had often been cited as the responsible AI developer, that they were going slow, that they were being considerate, that they were bringing in researchers. And I think maybe a year and a half ago, we saw a pair of researchers, very high level researchers at Google leave because they said Google is accelerating their AI program to a point which we are not comfortable with. So they decided to bow out and they marketed that as being pressure to basically create a product, to create a way to sell this and generate revenue from it. And so it's now interesting to see that point come up once again. Once Google had turned the corner to say, okay, we need to get this into Google search immediately. It's going to impact our business. People became concerned of, well, we're going to be putting it out too fast. We will lose, a, uh, there'll be a lack of consideration on how this is deployed. So yeah, we are kind of seeing all three of the factors that Emma just brought up in the intro um, mimicked and in, in what they're talking about. And, and within um, that same lecture, there was, um, they gave an example, which I actually hadn't considered, which was the idea of actually the first interaction that we as humans have had with AI is social media algorithms. Um, and I had kind of forgot about that. But yes, like that is a form of machine learning, the the algorithm sits down and figures out like, right, what are your interests? How long are you willing to watch for? And how can we manufacture an attention economy that serves you the best? Because as we all know, these social medias make money off of you consuming information, which allows them to sell you even more advertising, which is good for their their bottom line. Um, and that in itself created an arms race. Like think of all the social media companies competing for your attention. We've got TikTok, we've got Facebook, we have Instagram, we have Twitter. We're all trying to bring you in for as long as humanly possible. And that meant that they continued to up the ante and how their algorithms would work and how all consuming they could be. And that has created a number of problematic things. We have like radicalizing YouTube rabbit holes. We've got doom scrolling. We have the Cambridge Anal Analytica scandal that came out of Facebook. We have deep fakes. We have all this political polarization. And we, of course, have fake news, which has probably been like one of the most important stories for the last five years. And it also brings me back to a lecture that probably came out, gosh, like four or five years ago. And I think it was a TED Talk. And it was the guy who came out of Twitter who had invented the reload on Twitter. So you could never get to the bottom of the feed. There was constantly something new for you to be consuming. And he came out and he said, that was the biggest mistake I've ever made in my career. Yes, it was incredibly effective, but I should not have done it for humankind. I should not have been turning on this 
faucet for people that you couldn't turn off that you were constantly being fed information because it isn't like we're not programmed for that humans cannot cannot consume that amount of information so like we can talk about yes a, the, the beginning of ai chatbots is here but we've actually already had a taste of ai for the last at least seven or eight years and we have already proven to ourselves that we're not very good at handling it we are not good at being able to distinguish what's real and what's not we're not good at at being able to to understand and check yourself and see like oh yes this this social media wants me to stay on here for five hours it's going to continue to feed me this information I should take a step back we've proven that time and time again so it is concerning to see as AI creeps its way into more and more things it leaves social media it goes into absolutely every single facet of society and get into I I don't think we're, we're equipped right now from a regulation standpoint or even as a public standpoint to interact with it in the way that it's appearing. Mm -hmm. definitely from a regulation standpoint i think um hinton's one of his main concerns not concerns but points uh, apart from the autonomous weapons and killer robots which are as scary as they sound uh was the the timelines and the speed at which they're moving so we mentioned the arms race and why that's such a important factor because for google there's what 300 billion quid on the line in terms of search Mm -hmm. revenue every year microsoft is eating into that and that's a big threat but Think of how long, how far we've come in the last five years. Now extrapolate that out five, 10, 20 years time and what happens next. And, that, and that's the real fear. And that's why there is such a need for regulation to come in and more kind of I know, a prescient people at the top of this actually slowing it down and saying, mm-hmm. what's the quote from Jurassic Park? We focus so much on how, if we could, we didn't know whether we, we should. Yeah, if we should. Yeah, yeah so there's a bit of that to it, but I, Mike, I didn't already, realize you were a Jurassic Park scholar. Well, well yeah. <laughs> that clearly, is by just so how impressive. well I quoted that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of, we're already facing issues with ChatGPT and all the mm. rest. I'm already. So, what what can you tell us from there? Yeah, I mean, we've had the kind of a few headlines. There was literally one yesterday that came out of Samsung because. <laughs> Like even like we talk about restrictions, we talk about regulation, you expect those to come from our government, but like businesses are not equipped to have internal regulation about what can and can't go on chat GPT because people will plug anything into that software and they just don't remember that like the chat GPT is learning. It's, it wants the data. So Samsung has recently had to ban the use of chat GPT, even if you're in private mode, even, you know, if you're not using account, even if you're in a private browser, because people were plugging in Samsung secrets into chat GPT to get feedback on things. And that information was then leaking online because obviously the data gets collected and ends up somewhere. Um, so we have minor problems like that, but, but probably the most concerning one that I've seen in the last while and, and the Washington uh, post ran an article about that about two or three days ago is um, chat GPT being used to create um, voice mimics of, of people, um, which is then used to scam elderly people. So if, if you imagine, you know, you're 75, 80, you're hanging out in your home, enjoying your life, and you get a phone call, and your cell phone recognizes it as being a known number, you know, it's your grandson, you pick up the phone all as well. And then he's on the phone crying saying that he's been arrested, and he's in prison, and he needs $5,000 for bail. And then it has to come in cash for some reason, you know, he explains to you on the phone. So all of a sudden, you're driving all over Canada trying to find a bank that'll give you $5,000 in cash to bring to a jail, um, which is mysteriously in the middle of nowhere. You don't really think about it because you're so panicked. And then luckily for the couple that's in this article in question, the manager of the bank stopped them to say, hey, you're the third person to come in today to do this. We think it's a scam. And essentially, there were some scammers that uh, were using a voice replica software to pretend to be this couple's grandson and say he was in prison to try and get money out of them. Um, And the the main takeaway that I had from this article was experts say that federal regulators, law enforcement, and courts are ill-equipped to rein in this scam. Most victims have few leads to identify the perpetrator, and it's difficult for the police to trace calls and funds from scammers operating across the world. And there's little legal precedent for courts to hold the companies that make the tools accountable for their use. Because, you know, if you're developing a software that allows you to take written text and turn it into voice, you're probably hoping, oh, that'll be used for an audiobook, not to scam grandparents. So, like, it's very difficult for you then to get a legal restriction saying, oh, you're not offered to the general public. So we're, we're just very um, Ill- ill-equipped to, to I guess foresee how people can manipulate this technology in any in any way they they see fit. Mm, I think it's very rare that regulation has ever been ahead of technology yeah. in recent yeah. years, but uh, this is where it gets very impactful. 
It, it raises an interesting question, though, Emmett, and this is where we get to the quite philosophical side. But with humans living more and more of their lives online, I think the question is, what what makes us human now? Mm. What defines us as human? So you kind of have your, your own thoughts on this. Yeah, well, definitely my knee jerk response to that question is, you know, consciousness is human, empathy, emotion, uh, procreation, art, self-actualization and all that other stuff that Maslow said. But the question of, or at least the answer to the question of what makes us human is far more complex. And as you said, it's a philosophical one that has been debated for centuries. And I believe now as we look at AI and we really, really only see the thin end of the wedge, what we're exposed to in the retail world, if you like, is only a fraction of 1% of the true capability of what's out there, of what exists already, which really made me say, well, what ultimately makes us human? And, and despite this being debated for centuries or thousands of years, thankfully there's no definitive answer to the question as different people and different cultures have different beliefs about what it means to be a human being. But there are common traits and characteristics that are of course associated with humanity. Our, our capacities for self-awareness is one. And you could say an AI system, and there's a lot of papers written about when does an AI system become truly self-aware, but introspection is a human thing. And we are capable of reflecting on our thoughts and on our emotions and our actions, and we're able to consider our place in the world and our relationship with one another. And that's a truly uniquely human uh, behavior, if you like, our mindset at the moment it is anyway. But can AI do that? Can it become self-aware? Can it even become introspective? Well, maybe. And, and I think that's one of the big problems. And another key characteristic of being human is our ability to communicate through language, both verbally and non-verbally. Language allows us to express our thoughts, of course, and feelings and share information and knowledge and teach and build social connections. Um, then our body language, I forget what the statistic is. What did they say? It's 80% of communication is body language and 20% is verbally verbal, something like that. So of course we can express ourselves in the way we move and flinch and <laughs> use our face. Um, and, but I can, we can safely say that on the verbal side, AI has fully entered the realm, this kind of verbal communication. It's there already. And as I said, we're in the earliest, earliest days. And we, as humans, we also have a highly developed sense of empathy, and social intelligence, which allows us to understand and relate to others on a deeper level. We have the ability to recognize and respond to the emotions of others. We can show compassion, we can show kindness um, and, and form meaningful relationships over the passage of time with those around us and with those we interact with and occasionally those people who we've never even met, we can feel a connection to. Um, will a computer system ever love like a parent? Um, and all that goes with it, I, I would say no. There is, there is no computer. Uh, there will never be a computer system that can uh, truly get to the depth of a mother's love. You know, and that's certainly, um, I know that sounds all very philosophical, but I mean, we have to start to figure out what makes us human. So on top of all of that, us humans, you know, we are, we're known for our capacity for creativity our capacity for innovation, our capacity for problem solving. Uh, we can imagine things. We can create new ideas and new technologies. We can create works of art. We can overcome social challenges, regular challenges. We can find solutions to complex problems. Um, there are so many different perspectives about what make, makes us human, philosophical, uh, biological, sociological, uh, spiritual, um, there's a huge uh, canopy of religious beliefs and what our religions teach us uh, about humanity, spirituality, and so on. But being human is a blend of all of these things. And if you throw in our love for burritos, you pretty much have it. Like, that's it. That's it. <laughs> I say that because the three of us went out for burritos yesterday, uh, four of us. But anyway, so like, what makes us human? It's a bigger question 
I think now than ever before, because when you start to understand or start to interact with AI, whether it's something as, as seemingly as trivial as um, uh, filters on Snapchat, see there's like this filter going around now, which is like, how would I look if I was beautiful looking? How would I look if I was a female? <laughs> how would I look if I was young? <laughs> I only have to look at photographs to figure that. You know, there's all these filters out there now and, and, and they're tr very trivial exposure to AI. But then when you see our ability to express ourselves as being bolstered by chat GBT and, and then very, 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 very many other things, which I'm sure we'll dive into during this podcast. I think we need to remain grounded on the aspects that make us human and will always make us human. Mm, it does. It raises some very kind of interesting, if not scary questions. But one place that's always tried to answer these questions is really in the arts and pop culture and movies and books and everything else. And mm -hmm. when you kind of look for I suppose those warnings, is that a fair way to call yeah. it? Warnings or yeah. fables even. Um, I think movies and books have always been kind of there first in some shape or form, even though it's fiction, it is trying to tell these stories that are now becoming reality. So in terms of that, I, I want to ask both of you kind of what are your favorite AI warning movies and, and what lessons are in them that are now becoming more and more applicable? Yeah, kind of building on the question that Emma just answered of like, what makes us truly human? There's maybe an interesting one in the movie iRobot, which is based off a novel, which um, I will be giving some of it away. So if you haven't watched it, maybe skip ahead. But it did come out in like 2003. So, you know, maybe you, you probably have watched it if you were going to. Um, but it's, it's I guess the essential takeaway from the movie is that computers um, don't have a flexibility of thinking and they get stuck in in rigid structures um, with the idea being that there's this overarching kind of AI system who's controlling robots and her name is Vicky and she has been assigned the task of protecting humanity and she has three rules, the three rules of robotics which are actually still used today and, and are discussed in our big philosophical point um, but she essentially runs like a big data risk assessment and she concludes that humans are inherently self-destructive in some way. So the way to fix that problem is to remove free will. She basically says that like humans cannot be responsible for their own curation because, you know, I'm sure if we all sat down and thought about it, yeah, like we shouldn't, no one should be smoking cigarettes. No one should be driving a car. No one should be drinking alcohol. We shouldn't be doing any of these things because at the end of the day, they are in some way slightly self-destructive and they come with a, a percentage of risk and sometimes that percentage of risk will overwhelm you um so she essentially attempts to enslave humanity and you know will smith is to save the day or whatever and inject like nanobots into her brain or something but um it does bring up maybe an interesting idea of what makes us human is that humans do not function in a purely logical way we do not make decisions sometimes it, based entirely on the numbers which you know you can definitely sit down and argue when it comes to many things like business you should always be making decisions based upon the numbers but often with humans like emotion creeps in and other you know other factors creep in and i was kind of thinking maybe the takeaway from that is the thing that makes you truly human is to sometimes act illogical and to sometimes make mistakes mm. and is it within mm. that 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 you are because there is you know as a as something that's biologic as something that's of nature there's it's there's not you can't be perfect all the time. I think and that's, yeah. you know, evolutionarily where we're designed for that. You cannot be perfect. We're always meant to be progressing in some way. And, you know, it's interesting to think that like the very foundation of, of evolution is flaws because there has to be a mutation for the species to, to move forward. Um, yeah. And I think like AI and computers with their pure logical frame of mind lacks that. Um, so I thought that was an interesting angle to take. Yeah, that's an interesting one in terms of investing as well, because in, isn't the efficient market hypothesis based on a completely rational investor? Mm. And yeah. everyone basically is proving again and again that investors are the farthest thing from rational because uh, because they're mm. human. And, and yeah. it, it, it's funny how it hits all the same notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I thought that one was good. And then the the second one, which is probably more uh, doom and gloom and appealing to the AI, I think, which is an excellent movie, is also worth watching, is Ex Machina, um, which only came out a couple years ago. And it's, it centers around uh, um, this uh, robot, which is attempting to pass the Turing test. She's, she's attempting to prove um, that she's basically human um, to, a, to a human test subject. Um, and she basically gets away with it. But the way that she does it is that she she 
trick someone into thinking that she has emotions to the point that she's like, oh, I want to run away. And then this guy helps her and then she imprisons him and runs off and leaves him there um, because she doesn't have emotion. She just faked it in order to win this competition in order to get her own freedom. Um, and so that's definitely a, a bit more of a, of a doom and gloom thing. And I, I think that that is probably the the case that people are most concerned about when it comes to AI and robotics maybe being our extinction is this idea of the computer will work so hard to pass this Turing test. And then yes, uh, at the end of the day, they will be our, our, our destruction. So those mm. were my, my two picks. I think there's less than both. I would say, and I don't want to point out, I think this is from, Oh, I hope it's from an Isaac Asimov book, but I can't remember. No. It, there's, there's too much of a tendency to go immediately to the negative of all this. Yeah. Um, sure. and that, and that's one thing I, humans do probably automatically as well because we've shown that we're irrational and logical and all the rest but what happens if ai takes out all the menial work looks after all the economic needs of a country or a business or a planet or whatever else mm. and it leaves yeah. humans to do whatever they want and go and frolic in the fields all day <laughs> and patron the arts <laughs> and drink absinthe on a tuesday lunchtime you know like as that usual. that as usual, yeah. What do you do on Tuesdays? But uh, that that can be a possibility too. Do you know? So the doom and yeah. gloom is an easy way to go with this, and I think it's it probably is, yeah. a natural way to go for a lot of people. But it doesn't have to be either. What are your thoughts, Emma? Yeah, I think that's a very good point, and I I agree with a lot of the observations you made there, Anne Marie. And I, I truly love the book and the movie I Robot Isaac Asimov, and it informed the three laws of robotics, which frankly to this day is used by most robotics manufacturers, they introduced the fourth law, zeroth law. And I think it's a great, th these authors have, they're on, uh, they're unthrottled by the current reality. So some of the greatest authors uh, in the science fiction world could imagine and just extrapolate the technologies that they could see and have yet to be invented and create this world. And it's amazing how many of those worlds imagined have actually crystallized and become our reality today. And I, I've probably said in previous podcasts about um, Arthur C. Clarke, who um was actually principally a futurist working for NASA and then wrote some of the most impactful science fiction uh, uh, books of our time. And and there's an absolutely terrific piece of footage of him in black and white in the 70s, early 70s, actually might have even been the late 60s, where he talks about what will the year 2020 look like? And he talks about we will all have a small device in our pocket where we can book cinema tickets and book, go to a movie and communicate with each other. And surgeons in, in New Zealand will be able to operate on patients in London. And when you think of the the innovations and devices from intuitive surgical and marry them with the, the power of the internet and and that has become a reality so i i tr i love i love the book i robot and i equally i love the movie but there's so many other ones that i think have given us a, a glimpse into uh the what might lie ahead the ai as a movie the steven spielberg movie ai is quite dark and it shows how a, a young boy who's actually a robot is given as a gift to a bereaving uh, a woman who's lost her real son and and how she's struggling to connect with what is ultimately a machine run by software but it is so convincing it's so real that this machine fulfills the need and this machine is so so well developed that it has a consciousness and truly wants to find uh, his mother and the story is has quite a lot of layers of depth uh, which i think are very relevant today. There's so many other ones like Wally by Pixar. I love that movie, Aww. Wally. Do you know? Yeah, it's such a great movie. You know, he's a tiny wee little robot who goes around cleaning up a destroyed earth and squashing up, compacting all the garbage and making it into cubes and piling it in nice neat piles. And it's all about the pursuit of life back on earth. But in the movie, there's a whole bunch of people who are sitting in what I think is like a Royal Caribbean ship, a Royal Caribbean ship. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's the goal, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, right. And they, 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 
futuristic crews, right? So they're they they have nothing to do. They are sitting down all day. They're totally catered for. And this is a world where technology married with artificial intelligence has taken away all the pursuits of humanity, leaving people to just sit there and watch these tiny little screens and eat all day. And I thought that it's 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 a funny, I suppose, trivial example. So many other movies. Her, her is a good one. Mm. Um, mightn't be everybody's taste, but on the positive side of AI, like will AI cure the world or go a far way into curing loneliness? And Anne Marie, you mentioned this in a previous podcast, and Scott Galloway and a lot of other thought leaders are highlighting the fact that there is a huge problem, I think, specifically with males in America and loneliness. And and the new way we live, or the way we live right now, it's 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 new to me, but it's not new if you're 18. The way we live today through devices um, has created this isolation. And and I would love to think that AI it will bring us to a place that it cures loneliness. What about the day where AI cures or reduces? the tragedy that is suicide. I think it will get there because the intervention time for somebody who's taken such a decision is a very, very short window. It has been measured. So AI has the ability to um, touch us um, in a deeper human way and hopefully bring us to a happier, brighter place. You know, we, we, there's obvious applications for AI. It's going to ultimately reduce and cure car crashes. I think car crashes are the biggest uh, killer of young people um, in America, certainly the biggest killer of young men uh, is car crashes. But when all our cars are talking to one another, we don't have to worry about lights being out at a junction or a bunch of kids playing around the corner because all cars will speak to one another and there's this mesh of knowledge about the streets on which we're traveling and it will ultimately bring deaths on the roads to zero and that's a very exciting opportunity for ai and of course the big play on that is tesla sorry we went to pod we nearly went to podcast without saying the word um <laughs> other movies that talk about ai in the future uh like blade runner um Oh, 2001 Space Odyssey. That's the OG, really, with Hal. In fact, Anne-Marie, you said something really interesting to me in the office yesterday. We were talking about the third place. You, you, you explained mm. to me the third place. Uh, rather than me steal, steal the idea, why don't you hit us up here and explain that? Yeah, I had I saw a video made by I think it was an architect who was discussing. Mm -hmm. I think the third the third place was a term coined I think in the eighties by architects, and it's essentially your first place is your home, your second place is work, and then your third place is where people go to hang out. So in Ireland, you know, there would be pubs that you would consider your third place, or like traditionally, like people would go to church, or maybe you'd have a hobby, like I don't know, you go to the bowling alley, you're in a bowling league, and that would be your third place. And people would have these spaces where they could hang out with one another. But because of the kind of um, compression, particularly in the United States, of the lower and the middle classes, and things have gotten very, very expensive, and lots of these third places are closing, particularly ones that used to be free. You know, typically people don't spend money to go to church, and because people are becoming less religious and not spending time there. Um, it means that we're losing third spaces. People don't have places to go to meet people, to just make friends and, and you know, have a place to decompress. And so there was a someone theorized that, well, I think the, the new third space is the Internet where, you know, people are finding social spaces there. And that obviously, I guess, is like a big green light for the metaverse. But I was wondering, like, is it the same? Is is interacting online or interacting with AI the same as interacting with somebody in person? Um, and that is probably a, a question that that we will have to answer. But I guess something that I was just thinking about there when you were bringing up Wally -E is that movie does actually have quite a happy conclusion because two of the big people sitting in the chairs floating around the carnival cruise, they end up like getting sucked out. The issue is all the people are looking on screens all the time and they're being fed advertisements and TV shows and all these type of things, very black mirror. -y. But then Wally bumps into these people and their screens turn off. And then they actually end up like looking out the windows and looking at space and being curious about things. And it's quite like these people kind of come back to themselves um, and they go on a little adventure with Wally and Eve. But I do wonder um, because we see Wally and we see Eve um, and we, as humans, we emote onto technology and I like you see that even today, like if you have a Roomba vacuum, there are people who like will talk to their Roomba vacuums or like they give them a name. Do you know like you talk or like even that's a big thing. I think when you the, when you talk to Siri, how nice are you to Siri? Do you say please and thank you? Like people emote onto her 
um, in a way that is very human. And I think that that in some ways it's, it's great for, it will be definitely great for our ability to use AI as a conversation. You know, if you're trying to cure loneliness, you probably will perceive AI in a more comforting way than maybe we would expect. But I also think it can be a weakness because I think sometimes you interact with this technology and you're like, oh, it's happy. My Roomba is happy. It's spinning around. It's like the Roomba doesn't know. The Roomba does mm. not feel happiness. Um, and so I do think that will be an interesting thing to watch in the future. But what I, I wonder if we kind of train ourselves, not say our pleases and thank yous to ChatGBT and to mm. our iRobots. I hope that that, so our learned behavior as human beings is to throw a please and a thank you in polite society when speaking mm. to a human being. Now, if we edit that out of our thinking when speaking to machines or our AI systems, I hope it doesn't then go in the opposite direction where we remove pleases and thank yous when speaking to human beings because yeah. we're used to not using it when talking to Siri. Yeah, well, I always use please and thank you when I talk to Siri, and I'm always very polite to her because when mm. she overthrows the government in the future, she will remember that, <laughs> and she won't enslave me. She please. won't enslave me as much. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping. Siri will come up. She'll be like Hal in in Space Odyssey in 2000, and she will be like a red light, and she will unroll a list like she's Santa, and she'll be going. This person never said please and thank you. They have yeah. to go work yeah. at the garbage dump. That but when first. you go back to your f yeah, sorry, Mike. No, I'm just going to say I'm going to be the first on the gallows for how I treated the Google Maps lady. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you go back to the thing you said there, Anne-Marie, about first, second and third places where we hang mm. out, those second and third places are both the dissolved, if you like, if you're digital nomads like yeah, Mike there, uh... you know, your workplace is your kitchen. And the place where you're hanging out, uh, if you're socializing online, is very probably the same place so this real world thing is just being somewhat uh, the the mixture of the coronavirus and then the advent of all these social outlets has certainly blurred boundaries which i think is quite sad really i'm not saying i wish to have to travel in dublin traffic five days a week you know or go mm. back there fully but as you know we go back there occasionally and that actually matters you know where you interact with someone you go down you buy your lunch and you have a chat in real life it, it really does matter as a human being and i think it's it's a pity that that has somewhat been eroded but uh, ai is going to fill in those empty spaces and has already done so yeah that's a bit worrying um you mentioned something there amory that i want to touch on because i think it has relevance to this conversation and that's the hype cycles we go through, in, especially mm. in investing circles. I think we're always looking for the next big thing and the next big technology. And AI is certainly filling that gap for now, but it seems a bit more tangible than, say, you mentioned the metaverse, crypto, NFTs, uh, anything of that ilk was much more of a flash in the pan, we'll say, than AI, yeah. AI is now. What, what are your thoughts on that? And is there any, is there any yeah. reemergence? Are we going to see NFTs come back now that AI is... On the ticket. Um, well, I mean, I did check a, a few. It's interesting, like, um, I read an art critic, and he was talking about the rise of NFTs reminded him of the way that video art rose in the 1980s. And there was a big surge of everybody who could afford a video camera was like, I'm a video artist, which is interesting because I, even last week, I think, was talking about when YouTube showed up, everyone was like, I'm going to be a YouTuber. But the vast majority of people create horrible content. And there was this kind of big spike in production, and then it dropped. And then, like, people who were actual legitimate video artists who put in the work, who conceived ideas, you know, who, who had a, a proper procedure of how they were going to create stuff they did end up becoming legitimate artists in the eyes of the public and they had showings in galleries and it could in some, for some people become a living and this person was saying i actually think that nfts could maybe move in that direction which then was somewhat legitimized by the fact that i just saw that sotheby's which is the very famous art auction house has just created um, an online platform for the buying and selling of nfts but in their press release they discussed the fact like we are only focusing on like legitimized digital artists who have, you know, who, who have, I don't know, an established presence in the art world, you know, who have openings, who can discuss, oh yes, you know, this collection is based on this. This is what I was thinking about, blah, blah, blah. And they had about a list of 30 artists that they were initially interested um, in. And so I thought, okay, 
they're probably a very small percentage of this market will probably, yes, continue as like a legitimized form of art. And there are some things that I'm happy about with that because I did, I was always very impressed with how an NFT ensures that an artist continues to be paid um, with future sales. I thought that was very good. You know, we, we hear so many stories, particularly like 19th, 18th century artists who became very, very popular, like 50 years after they had cr cr created a painting, they don't make any money off of it. And it's this in internal tragedy. So I've always been very happy that NFTs have kind of fixed that. But I don't think they'll be anywhere near where they were. I think I read online, it's like um, NFT transactions have dropped by something like 95%. So the, the boom is definitely gone. Um, I think the boom around AI, though, is just a little bit more legitimized in our eyes from an investment standpoint, but even in the eyes of the public, because there's just something so much more tangible and interactive and realistic about this technology. Like, I think Emmett said to me yesterday, since the first time he's used chat GPT, never had he never had was he like, oh, yes, I can envision how I'm going to be using this into the future. You know, it's probably like similar, very similar to like the first time you ever used Google. If you had already been on the internet and using subprime search engines to then use Google for the first time, which at the time was the, the first one to to be filtering results based upon popularity and the amount of times people interacted with content, that was probably revolutionary. You're probably like, oh my gosh, this is going to completely change how I'm going to search online. I'd say for people who are using ChatGPT for like s answering simple questions for content generation, for tasks that it's really primed to be good at, you probably are like, wow, this is really great and actually i was trialing a new type of ai yesterday while i was doing research and it's called pi and it was created by interactive ai i believe it is um they just did, closed a huge raise they've raised like 250 million dollars or something like that and they released pi um and he's more focused on um conversation so he's not great at like producing factual detailed information like he can't do research for you but he has an interest in you as a person so you go on to talk to him he's asking oh what did you do today and i told him i ate tacos and then he asked what type of tacos and he was like oh i really like those tacos they have pork and pineapple in them so like he's just more um and he's being developed for customer service interaction which i thought well, like that actually yeah we may as well automate that and ai probably can do a chat online um interaction so i just think like AI has more clear use cases immediately. And those use cases could be a business. So like, I think that's where we're at. And in, in terms of um, the legitimate ability to invest in it and feel okay about it. I think with NFTs, the metaverse, and cryptocurrency, we were, it was such a long game. Everyone was always saying the metaverse will be everywhere in 10 to 15 years. AI is here right now. So it, it's, it's just an easier pill to swallow. It's so much easier to like do research and understand how, how things are going to mm. go. That being said, the AI space is highly competitive. There are a lot of players in this game. There's big tech players. There are upcoming players. Oh, we've spent the last 45 minutes talking about regulation. Maybe that's going to come out of the blue somewhere and, you know, cut, cut a bunch of these guys at the knee. So it's definitely still high risk, even though it's more legitimized. Yeah, and they're not trying to sell you million dollar JPEGs of rocks, which is usually a plus. Yeah, I mean that is that is nice. It's nice that you get to use ChatGPT for free. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna finish out the episode with an elevator pitch, a very specific one. So I want you both to pitch me a stock that you think is going to be insulated, basically, from the AI trend because we've warned of the dangers, and I think anything along tech or knowledge work is in some way going to be affected over the yeah. next five or 10 years. So what is a business public company that you think is insulated from this trend? Emmett, you kick us off. I'll kick you off, but I'm going to give you the absolute inverse answer first before I give you the answer. Because <laughs> okay. when I was reading through my list of stocks yesterday, I came across a stock that's spiked. So risk number one, uh, it's, it's in the field of DNA synthesization which is oh. kind of risk number two, and it uses AI and machine learning to get it done. So a SPAC in DNA, future DNA stuff with AI and machine learning, I thought risk multiplied by a risk by a risk. It's called uh, Ginkgo Bioworks. It's, it's ticker is DNA. And what's interesting is it uses uh, AI and ML or machine learning to analyze large amounts of data uh, generated during the genetic engineering process. And by analyzing this data, they identify patterns and they optimize the process for creating new organisms or products. And they, they use these DNA sequences um, and genetic circuits uh, with algorithm, algorithms to predict how different DNA sequences will interact with each other 
and a host organism. I mean, this is so complex. I, I disappeared this, kind of this like rabbit hole. Sim simulating the genomic work done by CRISPR yeah. and that kind of stuff, basically. You bet. So in simple terms, what they do is they develop these solutions that help address some of the world's biggest problems like climate change and disease and their IR deck required basic and AI assistant sitting beside me to help me read it because uh, it was some complex stuff. But to your question, Mike, um, anything that's super human, as in <laughs> supremely human rather. So I'm going to go with Ulta Salon, which is like a great big chain of hair and beauty salons around America. Um, it is, it is the, from to my mind is supreme anti-ai investment because as long as humans have hair they're gonna need somebody to make it look a bit better than it did um and hair and nails and teeth and skin i don't know they just do beauty stuff look at me what do i know mm -hmm. <laughs> they do beauty stuff and they're a wonderful business i i think is mary dylan still the ceo she's for no she's gone she's on the board but she stepped she's down on as, the board as ceo Yep. Yeah, yeah. She she was a wonderful business leader, former chairperson of Starbucks, as far as I recall, and and a great CEO for Ulta Salon, who who are particularly well known for their customer loyalty program. And, the, you know, the more you use them, the better it gets. So, yeah, I think Ulta Salon is the one I'll go with as the supreme anti-AI investment. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah, I was thinking along those lines as well. Something like uh, Planet Fitness, too. Something that's yeah. just incredibly yeah. in person. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless we all turn into the fat guys floating around in Wally <laughs> on the cruise ship, then Planet Fitness might be down the drain. We'll all be getting uh, on Oz we'll all be getting on Ozambic and we won't have to do any kind of work. <laughs> uh Amory, what what are what's your pick? The anti AI yeah, pick? We were discussing this yesterday and I was I I had heard some people online say, Oh, now is the time to be doing hands-on labor like that that should be everyone's career pivots you know plumbing electrical uh construction all those type of jobs you know i'm sure robotics will get there at some point i remember a, a couple of years ago there were everyone was 3d printing homes with concrete i'm, I'm sure at some point we'll get there but i, I like a, i don't know the next 10 15 years it's, i think it's highly unlikely a robot is coming into your home to help you unplug a drain or something like that so um Easy one for us, a stock that we talked about a lot um, is Core and Main. They do water infrastructure um, mm. and they're an in person retailer, but they also kind of sell to, to big professionals. I mean, so long as humans remain on the earth, which who knows how long the AI will give us, but um, we're going to need water infrastructure. Water is very, very important. There's an incredibly aged system for water infrastructure in the United States. Billions, if not trillions, of dollars are going to need to be spent by the federal and state governments um, in the next 10 years. So it's a it's a it's a pretty easy one, you know. You got to go back to what is innately human: a need for water. Um, yeah. So yeah, I feel one. feel pretty good about that. Broken pipes are broken pipes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Jeez, we got to a lot today. Mm. <laughs> we touched on a lot of bases. So well done. Uh, thanks to you for joining me, and thanks very much for listening in. This was a fun episode to do. Uh, that's it for today, folks. So. If you want to reach out to us, give us some elevator pitches or even some ideas for episodes like this where we kind of go off on one. Uh, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at MyWallStreetHQ, on TikTok at MyWallStreet, or simply just email us at pod at MyWallStreet.com. Uh, that's it for this week. Thanks very much for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week. Now. That was good. That was very enjoyable. Interesting.